Let's continue to talk about wrongdoing of real estate agents and see if we can avoid some more of these things. How about a failure to tell? Well, if I tell those buyers about those termites in the wall, I'll never get this property sold. If I tell those buyers about the fire in the attic, I'll never get this property sold. Do you not think they're going to figure it out after they bought the property? They're going to wind up realizing, hey, they didn't tell us everything. Now you've opened yourself up for a lawsuit. You may have to give back your commission. You may have to pay an attorney. You may have to deal with Trek or the local board. It just isn't worth it. Just go ahead. Tell them that. A lot of people will consider you to be an honest person. They may not buy that property, but they may buy something from you. If the seller says, don't you tell them about that anymore, you might want to think about getting away from that seller because every real estate agent is supposed to talk about the condition of the property. Well, what about bad advice? Let's discuss the possibility of you giving bad advice. One way you could do that is to go to a market that you've never worked before. Maybe a town that is 50 miles away. They may not even be on your MLS system. And you take a buyer over there, you start showing them houses, but you have no idea of what properties are really worth and you don't have access to their MLS so that you can put together a marketing plan for them. So you could wind up giving them some bad advice and they could wind up paying too much for the property. Well, that's just enough to get you into trouble too. One more thing that you could get into trouble over is relying on the seller. The seller's been in that property longer than anybody else has. He knows a lot more about what's wrong with that property than you could ever spot as a real estate agent. I don't walk over to the wall and plug something into the electric socket to see whether it works or not. But your seller knows where that electric socket works. One of the worst situations I ever got into was a seller that had built a pole barn and then he turned it into a house. The whole upstairs was just one large room with a bathroom at the end of it, and they had in that room what I called centers. There was a center for sewing, there was a center for watching TV, there was a center for sleeping. Downstairs was kitchen, dining, and a bathroom, at least half of the downstairs was, and the other part of the downstairs were still horse stalls. When the seller filled out the seller's disclosure notice, he calls me, he says, I don't know how to answer this question. I said, which question? He says, does the roof leak? I said, well, your choices are yes or no. He says, well, the roof leak doesn't leak, but... I said, but what? He says, well, I put in those two skylights upstairs, and on a very humid day, condensation will appear on those skylights, and it will drip off on the floor. I said, well, you need to take out a separate piece of paper and you need to write a note to the buyer letting them know about that problem and then suggest in there that they have a home inspector look at that particular situation. He did all that. I found a buyer and the buyer wanted to buy the property. They got the seller's disclosure notice, but the buyer would not hire a home inspector. Oh, that's okay with me. I'm not too worried about it. Later on that year, they had 20 inches of rain in 24 hours. The rainwater collected up at those skylights. It ran down the inside ceiling and it filled in an interior wall. And when the weight of the water was so heavy, it actually popped the paneling off of the wall and gushed across the downstairs area and flooded out the electrical works and the telephone system as well. Now the buyer's calling and threatening a lawsuit. I am convinced that that seller knew more about that property than he was really telling us. You do not want to rely on the seller for any information. When he tells you what the square footage is, don't pay attention to that. Pay attention to the appraisal district instead. When he tells you that the roof doesn't leak, look for yourself. Now my youngest son bought a house in Chicago not long ago and he's calling me for help. And one of the pieces of advice I gave him was, Hire a home inspector, but before you hire him, make sure he's willing to go up on the roof and look at it. You don't want one of these inspectors that look at the roof through binoculars from down on the ground. He called me a week later. He says, Dad, how's he going to inspect the roof with snow all over it? I said, Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how to handle that. I've never had that problem in Texas, 
but I guess he had that problem in Chicago. Well, the home inspector went inside the attic and looked around, and that helped him understand a little bit better whether there had been a leak or not, but he still didn't know how good the shingles were up there. I don't blame him for not going on a roof that had snow and ice up there, but you needed to make sure that you had somebody look at it. One last thing we need to think about in terms of misrepresentation. Not only do you not rely on the seller, don't rely on the previous listing agent. Maybe that property's been on the market before. Sure, you could copy those measurements off of that MLS sheet and put them on your MLS sheet. What if the agent didn't measure it properly? What if that agent had copied somebody else's? Now you're duplicating the misrepresentation that took place there. Don't copy the taxes they have there. Taxes may have gone up since the last time that this was on the market. You need to look up your own information and put that information together all by yourself. Well, let's make it simple then. What protection can an agent get in these real estate transactions we have? After all, we have cranky sellers, we have cranky buyers. It's always possible we could get ourselves in trouble. Heck, that recovery fund in Austin paints a bullseye on us. Lawyers know if they sue us successfully and we're judgment proof that the recovery fund will pay. So let's talk about some simple things we can do. Point out everything that you know is wrong with that property. Take the time to look at the property more closely. I've actually, in the early days of real estate, would walk into somebody's house, look at the inside and outside with them, sit down at the kitchen table and start filling out the profile sheet that is required for MLS. And I would get to the line, what kind of roof is it? And I'd already forgotten what kind of roof I looked at out there. And I had to ask the sellers what kind of roof it was. Now I walk around the house with that profile sheet in my hand and I can mark it off as I'm looking at everything. I've actually had some sellers say to me, well, now I don't know if I'm going to list with you or not. And I say, that's okay. I'm just filling this out so that I have a better feel for what the property is like and the condition it is in. So we can at least do that. We can at least get the seller to fill out a seller's disclosure notice. Now, when you do that, make sure you don't make any marks on it yourself. Don't even fill in the address. You want the ability that if a lawyer ever holds up a seller's disclosure notice in front of you and says, who made this mark, that you could point at someone else. Oh, I went out to list one property. The lady had palsy so bad she vibrated the whole time I listed her property. When I gave her the seller's disclosure notice to fill out, she says, well, I can't do it. Would you do it for me? No, ma'am, it's against the policy of our company for me not to fill out this information. Let me try that again. It is the policy of our company not to fill out this seller's disclosure notice. She says, well, I can't do it. I said, okay, well, you mentioned your daughter's coming to visit in a few days. Have her fill out the seller's disclosure notice on your behalf. Call me when it's ready and I'll come pick it up. Now you have the seller's disclosure notice. Read the thing. If it doesn't match up with what you observed in the property, then you need to make sure that you discuss it with them so that you can get that rectified. Now, some of the houses you're going to go into, they're going to have clutter in it. They're going to have things that are a distraction in there. You need to find some way to get that seller to make that house more presentable. You could tell them to do it your, how to do it yourself or there are a lot of free brochures and pamphlets that are available through NAR and TAR that you could download and hand to people on how to get their house ready to show property. When you have that seller's disclosure notice, you do look at it and you see how it is, but you also tell every buyer to get a home inspection. Insist upon it. I always do. Occasionally, I'll run into a buyer that says, Keith, if you think it's so important, you pay for it. Suddenly, I'm not so interested in them getting a home inspection. But I pull out a form that tells them they should get a home inspection. I write wavered across the middle of it and have them sign it and put it in my file. That's my proof that I told them to get one and they chose not to do it. Every home that I've sold without a home inspection report that is a home that I got a call within the first year. They found something wrong with the property, and then I had to talk to them about that. One fellow rented a backhoe on, and took it out to his property. 
Now, if you've never rented a backhoe, you need to do that one of these days. But don't do it in the city limits. We don't call them backhoes in the city limits. We call them gas main locators. As he was digging around on his property with his backhoe, he dug up the skeleton of a horse. He called me and he says, you didn't tell me there was a dead horse buried on the property. I tried to be funny with this guy and say, well, you wouldn't want a live horse to be buried on the property, would you? This was the wrong fella to try to be funny with. It just made him angrier. I explained to him that there's nothing on the seller's disclosure notice about dead animals buried on the property. I also explained to him that if I had known it was there, I probably would have pointed it out, but I didn't know it was there either. Knowing this fellow the way I know him, now that he's calmed down, he probably has the skull of that horse mounted on the handlebars of his Harley Davidson. But he sure was upset when he dug up that skeleton of the horse. So we order a home inspection. We make sure and have the seller's disclosure notice and we get it to the buyer. How's this for a suggestion? Most MLS systems have a way that you can attach documents to your MLS listing itself. How about uploading your seller's disclosure notice so that it is available to anybody that has interest in that property off of your MLS system? Why should you make them call your office and you fax it over or email it over if you can already attach it to your MLS system? Oh sure, I know what some of you do. You make a pile of copies and you leave them in the entrance way of the home that you have listed. That's okay, I guess but I think it would be better if you could have it on the MLS system. Somebody may have forgotten to pick one up when they were in the house. They get back to the office and want to write up an offer. If they could download it immediately, that sure would save them some time. Well, there may be things that show up on that seller's disclosure notice that the buyer is still going to be concerned about. Let's get an expert out there to tell them what it will take to get it fixed. There may be a mention of termites. There may be a mention of water damage. There may be a mention of previous flooding. There may be a mention of the age of the roof. These are the kind of things when we can bring somebody out and help them. You're not going to say, oh, that's not a problem. You're going to say, well, let's find out if it's a problem, and you're going to get an expert out. You're going to have a list of experts. You're going to have a list of everybody that does everything at your office. If your broker hasn't created one, you do it yourself. A lot of craftsmen are going to come into your office and they're going to ask you to send them some business. Keep them on the list. Whether it happens to be electricians, plumbers, or anything, have them on the list. And when you have that prepared list, when somebody wants to come in, you'll be able to automatically hand them that list and they can decide which expert they would like to use. Now, if you have one on there that's been a problem in the past, take them off of the list. I had a septic tank problem at my own house. I needed to hire a septic engineer to help me redirect and recreate a new, whole new system. What I didn't know is he'd already had a problem with the county employees that ran our water district anyway, and it turned into a big thing where they were going to punish him for the previous thing that he did on my property. After this was all over, I took that fellow off the list. I thought if he hasn't got a better working relationship than that with the county, we're always going to run into problems, and so I have new people on the list that I'll pass on to the buyers if they happen to need some kind of engineer for their septic system as well. Let's talk about doing one other thing to try to get some protection in this transaction. Document the unusual thing that takes place. What kind of unusual things am I talking about? I was showing one house to a buyer. We parked in the street because it had great curb appeal. I wanted to see it, her to see it from the curb. As we were walking up the sidewalk, it was a long flat sidewalk except one step up in the middle and then it was flat again. She was enjoying looking at the front of the house so much she didn't notice that one step there. She tripped over it and she plowed her chin into the sidewalk. That showing was over with. As I got her back to her car and I helped the bleeding stop and we asked her if she needed more help, do I need to take her to a doctor? Do I need to call an ambulance? Once she left and said she'd be okay, then I sat down and I documented everything that happened just in case I have to give some type of deposition someday. I didn't, but at least I had the information there in case I had to do something like that. 